Welcome fellow mushroom lovers. In this video, we will be exploring one of the most beautiful mushrooms on the planet, Amanita muscaria fly agaric. This mushroom has earned more attention than others due to its folklore and white spotted beauty, but also its medicinal mystery. We're going to take a closer look at this Mario mushroom, and I will share what I have experienced in making Amanita muscaria tea. Let's get into it. Amanita muscaria is mycorrhizal, which means there is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a plant. These mushroom fruiting bodies rise from the mycelium, the vegetative part of the fungi, which forms a web-like network underground. The mycelium wraps around the tree roots, supplying the tree with nutrients, and in return, the fungi receives glucose manufactured from the tree. I typically find these mushrooms growing under pine, as you can see in this video, but are also known to form relationships with spruce, birch, oak, fir, and cedar trees. Depending on the geographical location, this mushroom can exhibit its beauty in a yellow, orange, or red color. Rarely, fly agaric can be seen with a white cap as well. In Europe and Western United States, the cap will usually appear with a bright red hue. Specimens seen in the Midwest United States are orangish to yellowish, as in this video, these beauties were captured in Michigan during the month of October. Depending on the climate, these mushrooms can be found from late summer to early winter. The cap is usually 2 to 10 inches wide with a convex to flat shape or possibly sunken in in the center. You can't miss the whitish buff colored wart like patches scattered irregularly throughout the cap. However, direct contact of the cap through animals or heavy rain can wash away the buff colored patches so it is possible to see fly agaric with a bald cap as well. The gills are free or slightly attached and always appear white. Just like the spore print, the spore print will always appear white. The gills are broad and somewhat crowded, as you can see here. The margin, which is the spot where the surface of the cap meets the underside of the cap, the margin may have veil remnants hanging down from it. If still intact, a universal white veil can be seen before the cap fully opens up. This universal veil encloses the young spore producing surface into a closed chamber where the mushroom can optimize humidity and temperature for developing spore bearing cells. The stalk is usually 2 to 7 inches long. It's white, smooth, and has a large skirt-like ring if still intact. If you move towards the bottom of the stalk and move some of the soil around towards the base, you'll notice that there's a rounded basal bulb to it. If you look this mushroom species up in most mushroom guidebooks, it will flat out tell you that this mushroom is toxic. That's it. Maybe. Maybe, but it's the medicinal mystery. It's got me thinking. In fact, many cultures have used this mushroom medicinally dating back thousands of years ago. In some parts of the world, people still eat this mushroom as a source of sustenance. Just about any medication available must be used correctly and with the correct dose, otherwise Prescription or herbal medications can turn into a toxic situation. This mushroom is no different. If prepared and dosed correctly, the benefits could be harnessed, developed, and utilized. If you are into mushrooms, 
you may know that some Amanita species contain amatoxins, which are very dangerous. Amatoxins cause acute liver and kidney failure and are responsible for about 95% of mushroom deaths. Interestingly enough, fly agaric does not contain any amatoxins. However, it contains isoxazole toxins, known for changing one's psychological state. The two most prominent compounds found in this mushroom are ibotenic acid and muscimol. To oversimplify these two compounds, ibotenic acid is an excitatory amino acid agonist and it is responsible for some of the negative side effects such as nausea, vomiting, upset gastrointestinal system, and in high enough amounts, even seizure-like activity. Given that ibotenic acid can cause feelings of sickness, it is labeled as the bad chemical, while muscimol is viewed by most as the good chemical in fly agaric. I'm not saying the ibotenic acid component to this mushroom is a bad or useless chemical. It just appears to have developed more of a negative reputation compared to muscimol. Muscimol is a GABA receptor agonist. GABA is gamma amino butyric acid. If the role of muscimol being a GABA receptor agonist sounds familiar to you, you may have heard of the pharmaceutical drug class called benzodiazepines, such as Xanax or Valium. These pharmaceutical chemicals work on the body very similar to the way muscimol works. These GABA receptors are on nerve cells, so when the neurotransmitter GABA binds to the GABA receptor, or muscimol, or something like Xanax, binds to this GABA receptor, it is going to mimic GABA's natural calming effects, thus slowing down the body's central nervous system by inhibiting or reducing nerve impulses. Also similar to muscimol is alcohol, which is also a GABA agonist. Alcohol is known to mimic GABA effects in the brain binding to GABA receptors. Muscimol, with its GABA receptor ability, is believed to potentially treat neurological disorders, inflammation, addiction, depression and anxiety, insomnia, or even used on a micro level to provide a basic calming and relaxing effect. People do claim that muscimol in higher doses transitions from acting like a benzodiazepine or alcohol and starts acting more like a psychedelic. I have never experimented with high doses of muscimol myself, so I can't really comment on this one. So how do we convert the ibotenic acid to muscimol to minimize the unwanted symptoms in order to gain the desired ones? It starts with a process called decarboxylation. To decarboxylate or decarb this mushroom, it is lightly cooked or dried with a heat of 160 to 195 degrees Fahrenheit. When you introduce an acid such as lemon or lime juice, this converts even more. Another strategy to increase the muscimol content would be fermentation. It's known that fermenting this Amanita muscaria has the potential to convert close to 90% of ibotenic acid into muscimol. What I have done after collecting some of these magical caps is I put them in a dehydrator. This dehydrator decarboxylates the caps between 165 and 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the caps are cracker dry, they are ready to be stored in a vacuum sealed bag for future use. When ready to create the Amanita muscaria tea, I weigh out approximately 2.5 grams of the cracker dry caps and I add them in two cups of water with two freshly squeezed limes. I simmer this for about three hours and after the simmering, 
The remaining calves are strained out and the tea substance is saved for future use. With fly agaric, there's no true strategy to anticipate the potency of each cap. Not size, age, location, color, there's no true way to know. So knowing this, I always go with the less is best strategy. About four hours before bedtime, it was mushroom time for me. So I would consume approximately six tablespoons of the Amanita muscaria tea. This was enough for me to notice a change in my thinking and feeling. What I observed was so interesting, but not surprising. I noticed a feeling take over me of relaxation, uh, similar to taking a shot of alcohol or taking a small dose of Xanax. The interesting part that separates this mushroom from those other drugs is the sleep. I noticed my sleep was much deeper and I would reposition myself much less throughout the night. I didn't feel like I was drugged, I just felt like I was getting a better quality of sleep. Now I am a regular vivid dreamer, however, after consuming some of this Amanita muscaria tea, my dreams went to a whole nother level. If there's any psychedelic components to this mushroom, I noticed it while dreaming. It seems that the vividness, the duration that I would remember of my dreams, and the way that I feel during the dreams had been altered into a way in which I can't even describe with words. It's as if the mental and emotional healing during my sleep had improved, and I would wake up not feeling drowsy, but relaxed. I'm not trying to persuade or convince you to try in the Amanita muscaria yourself. Knowing that, misidentifying an Amanita in general could be a game of life or death. This information is purely for entertainment purposes, and by no means am I saying this is the most optimal way of utilizing this mushroom, this is just one man's story. It's fair to say that I'm not even scratching the surface of the depth in which this mushroom can be used for food or medicine. Overall, experimenting and getting to know this mushroom a little better was a very fun experience. Beyond that, sharing this experience is by far the best part. Thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next Mushroom Time.